Hello everyone and welcome back to the Tank Encyclopedia channel. I'm Luchin and I'll be your host for our first ever game review video. We'll be having a look at an old time classic called Blitzkrieg. So let's dig in and see if this game is still worth the while. Blitzkrieg was released 16 years ago in 2003, being developed by Nivel Interactive, a Russian company that also developed Silent Storm and Heroes of Might and Magic 5. It was originally published by CDV, a German company that also published games such as Codename Palancers, Cossacks, Doom and Sudden Strike. As you might have guessed from the title, the game is set during the Second World War, with the player taking the role of a commander on the German, Soviet or Anglo-American side. So let's answer the question, is it still good? Blitzkrieg is a real-time tactics game. Basically, every mission drops you on the battlefield with a number of units and a lot of enemy units. There is no building construction or ways to buy new units, although paratroopers can be dropped in during certain mission. The player can also replenish infantry units that suffered losses and crew artillery pieces that had their crews killed but have not otherwise been destroyed. The game sometimes gives you some reinforcements, but that is highly scripted and only appears in a handful of missions. However, as far as armor is concerned, what you get at the start of the mission is generally what you have to get the job done with. Because there is no resource gathering and construction and all the other stuff usual for the RTS genre, Blitzkrieg is intently focused on combat, tactics and surprisingly, logistics. The enemy is also similarly limited and the basic idea is to take out the enemy's troops while preserving your own to the best of the player's ability because every loss will hurt. That is until you finish the mission and don't care anymore because nothing really carries over and the game doesn't seem to care that much about your units anyhow. You have a set of tanks and artillery pieces called core units that you take along from mission to mission. But the worst that happens if you lose one is that you get a new one that has less experience. Blitzkrieg aims more on the realism side of war games, although the many technology limitations of the time means there are arcade elements aplenty. The game does however succeed in having a more realistic feel than many newer games, but it really hurts in certain sections, especially with regards to vision and firing ranges and damage mechanics. There are two kinds of missions in the game. Random missions that are auto-generated and are different every time you play them, and historical scenarios that are large scripted engagements revolving around a certain battle or operation. These are grouped in chapters and basically, to complete a chapter you need to finish at least one random mission and then the historical scenario to end the chapter. There are three types of random missions per chapter, easy, medium and hard, and each give out different rewards in the shape of singular unit upgrades, for example receiving a tiger tank for the next missions. These random missions do tend to get repetitive and grindy after a while. The maps are all seriously small for the kind of combat the game is meant to illustrate, probably because the game was made back when computers were dumber than a wristwatch. But this does have some predictable consequences. Planes just circle around a lot in order to try and stay on the map, the vision and firing ranges are also annoying, every unit has the same vision range, negating an important advantage of infantry and disadvantage of armor. Bushes and buildings can obscure the line of sight, as do smoke shells, a mechanic so useful I have not used it once in my many many playthroughs. However, the range limitations are even more annoying. With the exception of a couple of long range artillery pieces, all the tanks, infantry and 80 guns have the same firing range. You know that amazing 88mm gun that can blast enemy tanks at many kilometers away? In game it has the same range as your average submachine gun. Or, even worse, the tank guns have the same range as the late infantry rocket propelled guns, which makes infantry severely dangerous to armor late in the game. Also compounding this, the vision and firing ranges are usually the same, so if you want to kill something, it will be able to see you and fire back. Now, the combat is actually refreshingly quick because while the game still uses a health point system, most units die pretty quickly, which puts some extra pressure in planning attacks and defenses because if things go south, you won't have a lot of time to reassess and disengage before your forces are terminated. 
This is a real breath of fresh air compared to how other strategy games, old and new, handle combat, with tanks chugging away at each other for minutes before one dies. However, armor combat is a bit wonky as tanks will face each other and just keep dinging and missing each other before one goes up in flames. Damage taken is also not that predictable, you can take a shot and lose a nail of health and have the next shot from the same enemy completely obliterate you. However, this also makes combat seem really intense and puts you on the edge of the seat. The game does reward proper planning. Are your tanks entrenched? Are you facing the enemy? Is the enemy facing you? Are your tanks well armed and armor? All of these will influence your chances in the fight, but it isn't deterministic. There's a lot of randomness to it, and it sometimes gives a good feeling of realism. Sometimes it just gives a good feeling of bullshit. Now, there are 5 unit classes in the game. There's infantry, artillery, armor, aviation, and logistics. Infantry is probably the weakest of them all, as they just get mowed down by machine guns and enemy entrenched infantry. However, there was, is one type of infantry that is completely overpowered, and that is the sniper, which when lying down becomes completely invisible to anything not within 10 meters of him. Which makes it laughably easy to rain down artillery on enemy units. Oh, and he can also take out the crews of enemy guns while still not losing cover. Artillery comes in three shapes, AA, AT and long range. AT guns feel like cheap defensive tanks that can get killed by infantry and snipers. They're quite useful in defense and you'll need to be wary of enemy ones. Anti-aircraft guns, on the other hand, will make you understand why the AT-8 has the reputation it has. Besides the fact that a single AA gun will obliterate waves of aircraft without breaking a sweat, they are also vicious against armor and infantry due to their high penetration, damage and insane fire rates. Just slightly overpowered. It was at this moment he knew. He fucked up. Long range artillery is able to shell most of the map and is supremely useful either in softening up enemy defenses or obliterating them with the help of spotting from a sniper. However, artillery is vulnerable to enemy artillery and the enemy AI will make a point of sticking it to you with counter artillery fire if they have the ability to do so. Honestly, the counter artillery mechanic in this game is a really nice touch and adds a nice layer to the gameplay. Armor, just as we love it here, Tank Encyclopedia is the meat of the game, with tanks being vital to most attacks and counterattacks. However, except on the easy difficulty settings, doing a tank only charge into enemy defenses is a surefire way of losing them quickly. Aviation, while quite complex and powerful, is usually best left alone because it is so easy to counter. You can basically call a single type of air unit every couple of minutes, and so can the enemy. So pretty much anything you call in, the enemy will call in fighters and destroy it, and you'll do the same to him. You can try to be sneaky and let the enemy call in a recon plane and send in dive bombers while his air force is on cooldown, but even then you'll find out that AA guns make minced meat out of aircraft. There's really just one mission in Italy in the Allied campaign where aircraft just rule and kill everything off the map, but in any other missions, not quite valid. Finally, and most boringly, there's logistics. In order to function, your tanks need ammo and repair from time to time. Furthermore, bridges can be built or repaired, mines laid or removed, trenches dug, obstacles placed and abandoned guns captured. While the game doesn't usually give you the time or the need for such defenses, supplying and repairing your units is highly important. The mouse may be nigh unbeatable, but if it's tracked and out of ammo, it is also nigh useless, so take care of your trucks. The factions are pretty well balanced, although there is some bullshit related to the Soviet side, which has higher HP for the infantry and also extreme accuracy for the ground attack planes. Not to mention the Peshkas that just eat up 109s for breakfast. Hey, what did you expect? It's a Russian made game and Russian bias never gets old. There are four difficulty levels in the game which vary from a humble armored car can take on the entire Wehrmacht, to bomb everything and then bomb it again, to oh my god a panther the motherland is lost. I highly recommend sticking to medium 
easy is for people in a coma and hard is just unfair. All in all, while the gameplay suffers from limitations of the time when the game was made, which is an explanation, not an excuse, Blitzkrieg does still feel interesting and it somehow works together quite well. It cannot top newer games in the genre, but it can hold its own pretty decently. The story in Blitzkrieg is the best there ever was, the Second World War. However, there's a big asterisk to the sentence. The missions and action in Blitzkrieg are not historical, they are historically themed, merely emulating a pop culture kind of representation of the fighting they are meant to illustrate. There are three campaigns in Blitzkrieg with 7 to 8 chapters each, covering the invasion of Poland, the Winter War, the invasion of Norway, the invasion of France, the fighting in North Africa, a lot of the Eastern Front, the invasion of Italy, the invasion of Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge, and the Battle of Berlin. However, there are significant issues with the way these missions are presented and structured, even if they're not meant to be totally historically accurate. In the Winter War historical scenario, the Mannerheim Line is presented as a well-prepared series of heavy fortifications manned by significant numbers of Finnish soldiers. The Battle of the Bulge takes place during autumn because the developers couldn't be asked to make winter camos for the Allied units. Also, the Germans go up against well-fortified Allied units backed up by ample supplies of armor and artillery. During the battle for Stalingrad, you are tasked with defending the outskirts of the city, which is somehow meant to represent the two months of bloody fighting within, and then you have to break through the enemy lines which have somehow appeared on the left side of the Volga. Oh, also, there are tigers. The main exposition method is, of course, a whole lot of text at the start of each chapter explaining the situation and where the operation or battle originated from. And this is basically all that keeps the game from being a disparaged mess of totally unrelated scenarios because there's nothing linking most of them. You're not a certain commander or focused on a certain unit and there is no other reason the chain of missions is as it is other than that they are more or less famous and chronologically in order. The long texts at the start of each chapter flesh out the historical context and help the player whet his appetite for more information to be then searched in more reputable sources. That is not to say that these texts are not without their mistakes or intentional omissions. For example, returning to the Winter War, this was caused by the Soviet Union's search to improve its strategic position not its ongoing crusade of trampling over the independence of the states of Eastern Europe in concert and agreement with the Nazis. There are also smaller texts for each mission, but they are less historical and more informative from the gameplay point of view. There is also a fairly large in-game vehicle encyclopedia, which is halfway decent and is an amazing addition for 2003. However, nowadays there are a lot more and better information sources available online for free, so just come read Tank Encyclopedia and Plane Encyclopedia. There are also videos at the start and end of each campaign composed of part horribly colorized historical footage and part CGI, but they seem to serve little exposition purpose except for some eye candy. So while the story is the best there ever was, the storytelling is plain boring-ish and sometimes wrong. Blitzkrieg is full to the brim with tanks and AFVs, there's not even a single mission without at least a couple of them in. And there's a bewildering variety of models represented ranging from the Vickers 6 ton medium all the way up to the mouse, all with their own armor, penetration, damage and mobility values. And almost all of them with the same view and firing ranges. But the thing that I really love about tanks and Blitzkrieg is that while they feel immensely powerful, a bit too much so actually, and they are one of the most important instruments of war in your arsenal, they aren't the ultimate wonder weapon a lot of people believe they were. Poor deployment, lack of interim support, lack of reconnaissance and proper logistics will let them down, and there's a lot of stuff on the battlefield that can and wants to kill them, 
they feel powerful while also feeling vulnerable, which is the kind of balance a lot of strategy games fail to achieve. Of course, the game has a lot more stuff to illustrate and remind to those interested in the history and particulars of Armored Warfare, and a lot of this is really common sense but seems to have been drowned out lately by a lot of white noise in the military history circles. So just a quick recap, anti-tank guns are extremely effective in the defensive unless properly softened up by artillery and they were responsible for most of the tank losses in the second world war. Anti-tank rifles were a thing that could really kill tanks, until they couldn't and infantry became powerless against tanks for a while, and then rocket propelled grenade launches became a thing and the doctrine changed forever. Air power can kill tanks, but it's not really that good at it. It is however very good at killing everything that supports tanks and thus making them less effective. Reconnaissance is often the difference between life and death. Most of the vehicles designed and built by the great powers were quite competent in their roles. Mines were actually really important at a tactical level. The Su-152 was an amazing tank destroyer and a horrible tank destroyer at the same time. The T-34 and KV-1 were really scary to come up against operation during Operation Barbarossa when they worked. And the list can go on forever. There is a good deal of bullshit as well, like Tigers at the Battle of Stalingrad, but there's also a lot of good stuff and it's a joy to play for the tank enthusiast. Many people don't lend much importance to game tutorials, but taking into consideration the various genres and mechanics we'll encounter in our travel through the world of tank gaming, some introduction and basic overviews are more than needed. Blitzkrieg has 6 tutorials, one for each of the unit classes, plus the force tutorial for people who have never seen a computer before. There is also a sort of introductory mission at to each of the campaigns, although it is only mandatory on your first playthrough after installing. It acts as a sort of overview of the most important mechanics, a sort of memo if you pick up the game after a while and can't be bothered to redo the tutorials. All in all, the tutorials and learning part of the game are competent, if a bit sterile, but they famili familiarize you with most of the mechanics of the game. The AI in Blitzkrieg has two parts, the Unit AI and the Enemy Commander AI. The Unit AI is fairly acceptable, pathfinding is decent, units attack when they're told to and usually what they're told to. That's not to say the units don't do the dumbest stuff at times. For example, there are times when you want to quickly disengage your tanks from a problematic engagement, in which case they should ideally back up. However, there's always that one stupid tank that decides to take its time, turn all the way around and present its fat juicy ass to the enemy guns. Trucks also sometimes decide that they need to go to the supply depot that is through the enemy lines and get killed. Furthermore, the move attack command is sometimes bugged and units don't stop when they encounter an enemy to engage it. While it doesn't always happen, it's often enough that it is annoying and requires constant attention. Furthermore, there's no way to set the behavior of the AI, you can't ask for it to be evasive or especially aggressive. However, besides these, the unit AI is okay at what it has to do, not that there's much to do with no cover system at all. The Commander AI, on the other hand, is generally quite passive and, unless scripted, will barely react to you barging through its front lines. The only things it seems to do is call artillery on your troops, counter battery, and very limited local counter attacks with troops that are in the immediate vicinity, although these counter attacks seem to mostly depend on the difficulty setting. However, if you've broken through and are threatening the enemy's rear, it'll gladly just sit there and wait for you to mop up all of its units, even if the forces at its disposal could erase you from the map. And while this wouldn't be that much of an issue if all the missions were heavily scripted to overcome it, most of them aren't and rely on this AI laziness to allow you to defeat far superior enemy forces in a piecemeal fashion. You generally won't be fighting the enemy AI commander as much as you'll fight the already existing troop dispositions that you'll need to figure out how to destroy one at a time. Blitzkrieg's combat interface is pretty straightforward and spartan. There's a mini-map in the lower left side of the screen, 
which is probably the most useful part of the interface, letting you know about enemy AA and artillery fire, reinforcements and losses of core units. However, it's quite quiet when non-core units get killed, which is a bit annoying if you're fixating on other parts of the screen. Next to it is a panel of buttons with the orders you can issue to the units you have selected, as well as the button to call in air support. These are fine, but on larger resolutions are quite small and tedious to press, so it's better to stick to keyboard commands. Next to it is a small summary about the unit your mouse is over, mentioning the unit name, armor and armament characteristics. The, there are also really, really tiny bars for health, primary and secondary ammo and experience for the unit you have selected in the lower left corner, just under the minimap. Other than these and the objective text boxes, there's nothing else to get in your way. The rest of the interface that appears for the chapters and mission selections has an interesting aesthetic, the background looking metallic and slightly worn out. Kind of like how Tank Encyclopedia is, so I might be biased on this one, but I'm okay with it, it keeps the tone. All in all, the interface is competent and does the job quite well, even though it doesn't scale well to modern resolutions. For a game that is over 15 years old, Blitzkrieg's graphics have not aged that badly. Don't get me wrong, they have aged, but somehow the sprite-based graphics still look quite okay. Honestly, far better than the fully 3D Blitzkrieg 2. Let me explain. All the units, foliage, buildings, bodies and husks, explosions and shell craters are not actually in 3D, they are 2D images that are placed on the only 3D element, the terrain. And yes, there are hundreds of images for each unit in order to show it from all angles and allow the game to do complex stuff such as turning around, turning the turret, firing and absorbing the recoil and raising the gun barrel. However, the method of rendering the game was also far less computer intensive and the quality of the sprites make the game good to look at even today. All the units are superbly made and the level of detail on the tanks, for example, is far above what could have been obtained in that time using 3D models. The effects look quite good, from the explosions to fire, the track marks behind the tanks, weather and engine smoke. The unit destruction effects also look quite good, with turrets flying off the tank depending on the kind of damage it took. Now, the resolution is limited to at most 1080p, which is not exactly eye candy material by today's standards. Also, expectedly, there are none of the modern gimmickry such as anti aliasing and post processing. The main menu interface is limited even more and is probably the ugliest part of the game. Still, all in all, I think Blitzkrieg graphics and aesthetics have aged surprisingly well and it's still a pretty game if its low resolution is forgiven. Blitzkrieg's audio is pretty standard, it doesn't especially shine, but it has no major flaws either. The music mainly consists of various drums, violins and trumpets with a clear classical and militaristic feel. It does complement the game and its style quite well and is well timed with the action in the game bringing some valuable atmosphere. The sound effects like noises from the engines, tracks, firing guns, firing machine guns, firing rifles, explosions, planes flying overhead are all good enough but they appear a bit bland after some time. All tank engines, guns and tracks sound pretty much the same and it is slightly annoying that sometimes the tracks sound far louder than the engine, which shouldn't be the case. They also have an interesting mechanic where you can hear engine and track sounds from under the fog of war, allowing you to guess when and where the enemy attack is coming from, but it might be a bit uh, overdone to the point it is easily abusable if needed. When you select a unit, it responds in its native language, be it Russian, German or English. This is neatly done with the accents sounding quite natural and the unit responds depending on the unit type and the command it was given. There are even different answers and accents for the British and American units. However, one problem with the audio of the game is that it's not very informative. Sometimes units will scream that they're under air attack, but otherwise they'll stay quite quiet while getting massacred by the enemy. For example, I had a moment in my campaign with the allies when I took my tanks to attack an enemy armor group and was just calling artillery support, however, my artillery wasn't firing. Why? Because they had just been massacred by a single panther, 
the game didn't utter a single sound to let me know. However, all in all, the audio is okay and does the job well. I had never played Blitzkrieg multiplayer before doing this review, so this was definitely a new experience for me. Neville, the developers, recently launched new multiplayer servers for the game and it works through Steam. You can send invites to your Steam friends and they can join you in games you play. It's a nice touch for a game this old. You can also play over LAN and over the internet, but I have not tested either of those variants. There are two gameplay modes, Assault, where one side attacks and one side defends, and Flag Control, in which each side has to capture some points on the map and they get some tickets for each point held. There's not much complication to it, although I do love that they have embraced asymmetrical balance, with the opponents having seriously different armies on some maps. Not to say that that always works. One of the games I played pitted the Germans, which had no aerial support, but a metric ton of flak guns, against the Americans, who had a lot of aerial support, which was sublimely useless. There aren't that many maps around, about two dozen or so. The games play out just like the normal mission, each side is granted a certain number of units depending on the map, and off to the fight you go. However, there are some problems with the server lag, I have no idea where the physical servers are based, but both me and my opponent had large lag between issuing a command and having the unit executed, and this was by far the biggest problem with the mode. Having such lag is not ideal when you're trying to disengage from a bad situation. All in all, I really enjoy the multiplayer, it's really fast paced and having a proper opponent makes the game shine far better than single player does. The server lag is an issue, so it might be advisable to stick to Hitachi or other ways of playing multiplayer, but it is not game breaking. However, there's no progression or awards or any of the gimmicks usual to newer games. I came into this review really expecting that my peachy view of Blitzkrieg would be shattered once I took a more meticulous look at it, but honestly, the more I play it, the more it seems like a good, if old, game. The gameplay is solid and actually enjoyable, there's tanks galore of all shapes and sizes, and the interface, audio and graphics are okay. The multiplayer is quite fun as well if you can find anyone to play it with. It has aged, that is true, but the game has aged far better than most of its contemporaries and many newer games. Furthermore, at a price of just $5 on Steam along with two expansion packs sprinkled on top, it's a steal. There are better games out there on which you can spend your time, but if you've already been through them or you just want something good on the cheap, Blitzkrieg is still a good choice, I recommend it. Plus, it works on potato computers as well, although do note some compatibility issues with newer systems have been noted by some people. So, what did you think of Blitzkrieg? Did we miss anything in our review? If you like our content, please consider donating on our Patreon. The money gathered there is used for the amazing illustrations on our website. Also, make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. Anyway, this was all for this video, I'm Luchin and until next time when I'll be reviewing Armor Contest, keep us in your sights.